for. I'm Stephen Watkins, uh, one of the architects here. Peter Chen, technical marketing engineer, is going to help with some of the uh, demo pieces. And so I just wanted to start off and talk about the secure SD-WAN architecture components. And so when we talk about SD-WAN here at Fortinet, like Rob mentioned, we're really talking about secure SD-WAN. Uh, the the Forta Gate is the platform for that. Forta OS is the underlying operating system for that solution or that set of solutions. But as you can see, it's much more than just WAN path control, application awareness, and application steering. So those are the foundational pieces of an SD-WAN solution. Uh, but FortiGate and Fortinet, we have a greater vision for secure SD-WAN, including identity-based policy. Because we can identify those users uh, within the environment, we're able to introduce identity-based policy to our SD-WAN solution, as well as offer a solid point for consolidation. When we talk about the WAN edge, a lot of our customers and a lot of the industry is looking toward consolidation at this point. And so being able to bring multiple feature sets, including routing or um, potentially WAN optimization, or in our case, SD-WAN, in addition to next-gen firewall, we can really kind of consolidate the edge devices into one and offer a much more manageable solution through that single pane of glass. Just some terminology, just to make sure we're all on the same page going forward. SD-WAN is really that WAN edge kind of, uh, again, it's the, uh, the WAN path control. So being able to control different connectivity points. And so connectivity to the MPLS, again, running BGP potentially over your MPLS, connectivity to the internet, an IPsec tunnel over that same broadband connection or multiple broadband connections, and then potentially even a, a cloud connector sitting out in AWS or Azure to be able to you know, uh, con connect through IPsec tunnel directly to those particular elements that you have out there, whether they're SaaS or uh, infrastructure. And so we look at secure SD-WAN, we really add in the NGFW capabilities. And so no, no surprise there, it's integrated, everything happens together, not apart, it's not a it's not a virtual function. It's fully integrated into 40 OS. And so everything happens in consonance with one another, not a bunch of different handoffs to uh, virtual functions or a separate third party solution. So when we talk about SD branch building on secure SD WAN, we integrate the switch and the AP. And in this case, with 40 AP, 40 switch, we have 40 link which allows us to automatically connect to those, manage those devices. Again, we'll see some of that in the demo, but ultimately allowing us to integrate the access layer into the security of the SD-WAN solution. And lastly, secure SD branch. Really bringing in the foundation for Fortinet security fabric. And so we're going from all the way back at the endpoint whether it be one of our partner or fabric ready partners, or whether you're using 40 client, NAC solutions, all of that is integrated for that visibility, that broad visibility for the integration, as well as the automation that we can gain. And so we'll talk about that much more as we go through our demos and as Alex really uh, highlights the fabric. So, so with, the, with the box basically, so APs, all of that, the controllers all run on the same single box. It can do everything at once. Yep. And so what you'll see is you'll see that this FortiGate can actually manage everything. And if you have multiple sites, you can have a manager, which will be able to provide the same sort of functionality from that, that central point. The other point, uh, for example, you have the uh, MPOS connections. So how, how you manage this environment? You have a, a, a specific tunnel that you can verify of the path optimization, for example. <clears throat> so is that, repeat that question, please. Yeah, for example, you have uh, MPOS connections there. Mm -hmm. So how you manage it? What's the best path? To right, that's our SD-WAN solution. We'll talk about that a little bit. So essentially, uh, we'll get into how we manage it, but we do active path measurement. Um, that's how we determine based on performance SLAs, how we protect application performance, right? And so we we uh, allow our customers to define those performance SLAs, saying this is, this is the minimum amount of latency or jitter packet loss that we're willing to accept 
for a particular application, and then they can choose which one of those members in the virtual WAN link um, that they want to, to use, either primary, secondary, or uh, you know, if they go to the default, we can balance over multiple uh, WAN links. However, uh, we actively measure across those WAN links to determine uh, based on your strategy, right, which is a policy um, object, based on the strategy, which particular WAN path uh, SD-WAN will select and send that, that traffic over. Now that, <coughs> that active measurement, is that synthetic transaction or are you monitoring actual real life traffic to determine actual performance? So we're, we're not uh, monitoring traffic per se, we're just doing active measurement with um, a number of protocols. So we're doing, uh, you know, ping or HTTP or TCP UDP echo or even uh, two active measurement protocol TWAM. It does, uh, does an operator have the ability to go in and influence the way those probes maybe get QoS marked or, yep. um, because I, that's a big challenge with some other solutions is, yeah, we have, you know, essentially uh, amped up SLA, right? We're going to send traffic, see how it performs, but that traffic gets sent out as network control traffic and it gets dropped into whatever QoS policy you have set and you don't have any way to manipulate that. So within your system, I can manipulate that and say, I want management traffic to want, not only monitor, you know, what voice performance is like by marking it like a voice packet, but then also what my regular data performance is like by not marking it like a voice packet. Yeah, and, and one of the other things that we can do for the performance SLAs is you can choose your target, right? And so you can, you know, if you're Office 365, you can choose login, uh, you know, office365.com slash login as your target, and then you can prioritize that particular traffic so that, you know, you're, you're not getting... Uh, queued back there into into everything. Okay, so just for clarity, and I don't want to bog it down, but you're saying oh, we can identify management traffic by saying what the target is, and we set our own QoS policies, or can we set how management traffic gets tagged out of the box? Right. So the idea is, if I have an SLA across my my MPLS network, I might have sure. three queues uh, that are available that are available to me, right? At three different priorities. I want to monitor all three queues. I want to know how traffic in all three queues is going. Like, because I don't want to move my voice traffic if my data traffic is being dropped. Because my voice traffic is still operating just fine. Maybe I just want to move my data traffic off. Sure. Do I have that granularity? Yes. Or? Okay. Yes. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that that's one of the special <laughs> things about the performance <laughs> SLAs is being able to sure. define a performance SLA and associate that in policy, which is application based, right? And so you can make that application. So, for instance. If voice is, is fine, but you know, you're starting to see some congestion and you know, you're not meeting those SLAs, the you know, other traffic or specific applications, you could move to another um, path without moving the voice and therefore you know, improving or, or protecting the performance of the voice. Certainly, you could also introduce QoS, which would you know, help that as well. If you have the, uh, one of these partner organizations, whether it be McAfee or Carbon Black installed on the endpoints and things. Do you still need a Florida client as well to kind of uh, fill in that fabric? Nope. Nope. So these are fabric-ready partners already, and so these just really plug right into the to the fabric. And so if if somebody's not a fabric-ready partner and they have an API, we could leverage API, right? Um, we could leverage their API. They could leverage our API. Um, so yeah, but if you already have one of these fabric-ready partners, they just they're fabric-ready. What does it mean to be fabric ready? Is it just you've already done the API integrations or is there some other yep. level of integration? It's that it's a we've done the API integration or they've done the API integration to make uh, that particular product work in the fabric. Or so you know, communicate with the fabric both ways. So sharing intelligence, receiving intelligence, that kind of thing. And so are the APIs also available to end users to set up their We have an monitoring. open API architecture, yeah. The That's end users can do whatever they want. Yep. So before digging deeper into SD-WAN, I see a ton of value in having all of those different components from wireless to SD-WAN to UTM features in that single box, um, you know, that single management console, but it also seems like a, a bit of a risk there. So from a hardware and software architecture perspective, what steps have been taken so, you know, a bug in the wireless code doesn't crash my BGP processor? You're running each feature in a separate process that I can shut down if it's not needed or containers or how is it architected to, to mitigate that risk? Alex, do you want to take a look? Yeah, so, um, you know, internally uh, there are a number of different controls to keep 
certain process efforts like the routing process. Um, we'll run them on specific cores uh, to keep some of those things same, the, uh, separate. Uh, some of the things are common. I mean, obviously, we're also using a common set of hardware, so the, the, the general purpose management CPU, that's, that's going to be common between, the, the, you know, between those different things. But uh, we do extensive QA for uh, you know, for all of our components, just you know, individually as well in combination, to make sure that they're not um, they're not stepping on each other's toes. But you know, in your example, you know, what prevents a a bug in say the wireless code from crashing the entire box? We don't have like internally. We're not uti utilizing containers to uh, try and separate those things. Uh, unfortunately, the overhead would be too much, and then we would also not be able to take advantage of our ASICs and our hardware acceleration in those regards. Um, so. You know, there's definitely some pros and cons to that, but I would, you know, my my answer for that is we do extensive QA to make sure that you know we we find all of those issues. But as every company, you know, there's always bugs that that will come through, and we have a uh, extensive support system where if you have a a critical P1 bug, you know, we'll work on it until that problem is solved. Um, and one of our internal um, support processes called the, the top three process is one where if you've got something critical and, and, and we, we move it to this, this top three queue, which is what gets worked on until the problem is solved. So some of the things are taken care of in architecture, but not everything. So it's like, you, you know, you're not going to have as much separation just because we would lose some of our efficiencies in that regard. So I've seen a push with, with certain vendors to make things a little bit more modular. So if I want to update just the wireless code, I can mm -hmm. do that, or just you know the routing code. Is Are there any plans to do that type of thing so it's not just a single monolithic software image? Um, so there are some components that are already like that. The IPS engine, the um, AV engine, those are separate ones uh, because for, for those very reasons. So we can update them separately. Um, but you know as I mentioned, the by having separate modules, you lose a lot of the efficiencies that you can when they're when they're combined, and that's just an architecture decision that we've made. Now, outside of that, we have full HA capabilities, both you know um, uh, with multi with uh, single HA boxes, or you can do a cluster. So if you have any sing a single failure in something, something else can take over. Um, it it's not going to necessarily cover all the cases, but that those those are the things that we're trying to do because performance is one of the the main things that our customers are looking for, rather than the you know the the edge case of a of a software bug. Uh, if if that would have come if that comes up a lot, like if we had a lot of bugs and that was causing problems, our customers would demand something like that, and we'd have to make that better. But right now, I think the 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 QA and the separation that we have has been has worked for our customers. And and, and I, I just want to add that the AP and switches are a separate products. So the large software defined branch wins mm -hmm. that we are seeing in an enterprise, they are not buying wireless inside uh, 40k. They prefer to buy a separate AP, separate switch, so the, and they can, all, of course, for all of their software, they can independently upgrade that without 40 gate. So, so that's that's really what we have seen exactly to your point of not having everything into one box. We can extend that. So I'm sorry. So the, what's acting as the wireless LAN controller in that situation? That, you said so, the switches. So we have access point called 40 AP. That's that's one. We have switch called 40 switch. That's second device. And of course, FortiGate is the one which combines security and SD-WAN. So there are three different boxes that we are talking about there. But, so, but the single controller is the FortiGate. Yeah. Right? right. The FortiGate can control the switch and the AP in addition to all of its internal capabilities. And, and we do have a separate uh, wireless controller that can also be used. So again, you can separate some of the things, but I, I, if if you're just talking about the case where it is combined into the, into the FortiGate, you know, we we have the what I mentioned before. But if you want separate hardware for the controller, you could do that. And that's why you'll see these branch offices. Mm -hmm. To combine everything into one. They, they want less boxes to manage. We, and we'll see that in the architecture side for the branch. But there, you know, most branches are, are doing that. They're letting the gate uh, be the controller for, the, for their switches and APs. Um, you know, larger organizations, maybe they're bringing in a wireless controller to kind of abstract that away from a, a gate and you know, protect that, if, if you will. And just out of curiosity, what's, uh, can you give a, maybe an idea on, on the size of, the, of maybe those branch offices where, where, I don't know, maybe in your, in your guys' experience with the, with the product, where folks are wanting to actually decouple? Uh, probably that when you get into the enterprise size of, uh, you know, branch offices versus, you know, a, a retail location or, uh, you know, a small um, 
clinic or doctor's office, but when you start getting into regional medical centers or things like that, where you get larger enterprise, you probably see the, the separation. Okay. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's not always size. Um, uh, the, the use case, so distributed retail, where the, where the FortiGate is, is not necessarily where they want the wireless. So that in that case, they would want to decouple, even regardless of the size of the office, because they need that. They need the wireless for the front office, and the FortiGate sits in the back office. But if it's a uh, small SMB where it's you know one or two offices, they're going to have the wireless that covers the whole building from wherever the the FortiGate is. Do you build overlay over MPLS <clears throat> or no? Oh, you can you can build an IPsec tunnel over MPLS. Uh, not going to stay here long, but uh, ultimately digital transformation, Narav mentioned, digital transformation, huge driver for SD-WAN and, and uh, branch uh, modernization, if you will, uh, for us and other vendors as well. Uh, but these things right here are really what we're going to key on in, in Peter's walkthrough of the, uh, the UI. WAN path control, uh, application awareness, those performance SLAs that I spoke of, really helping us protect the performance of those applications. That's what's really critical. When you're choosing which path to take, it's not because one uh, sells M&Ms, the other sells Mars Bar, whatever. It's based on the performance and the user experience, improving that user experience through direct internet access or uh, quality of service through uh, your MPLS, improving that. Uh, and then lastly, the, the result of that application identification, WAN path control, is that dynamic application steering that, that results? So, Peter? Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. So, uh, let me try to make the font bigger. And introducing yourself? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, Intro. Um, I'm Peter, technical marketing engineer. Uh, okay, so we're logged into a FortiGate with uh, SD WAN enabled. Uh, I want to show you guys how um, we can solve the use case of digital transformation. So in, in our scenario here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create application steering policies um, for Office 365 and Salesforce traffic. So we have on the FortiGate, you know, a bunch of different interfaces. You have your WAN interfaces, you have your other ports, you have your Wi-Fi. We even have a 4G LTE 40 extender, which we have on the desk over there connected. There's a SIM card in there and, you know, out it goes. Um, you know, we have our public internet connection, we have MPLS, and we've built uh, two overlay uh, IPsec tunnels um, over the uh, public internet connection as well as the MPLS. So to set up the SD-WAN, it's really simple for our customers. They simply flip the switch right here, enable, and they add whatever interface they want to participate um, in the SD-WAN uh, virtual uh, interface. So as you can see, the public internet, the MPLS underlay, their members, and then the two VPN overlays, as well as our LTE. And if you want to add any more, it's as easy as uh, clicking the plus sign and then uh, choosing from the list of uh, available interfaces. These would just be your external interfaces. I'm, I'm assuming yes. that internal is just assume that, yeah, we want this routing over it if I'm going to enable yes. SD-WAN. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you make it active backup between MPLS and broadband? Well, active backup? Yes. Active. I think you're saying active active, right? Active active. Active active, it seems by default because I don't see any configuration here. That's why I was trying to see if it's active backup. Yeah, th this is just where you define the which interfaces you want to participate in, in SD WAN. So there's no policy. Here. Yeah, the policy yeah, will be the policy is not here. Still to come. So we have three main sections. You define the interfaces and then we talked about SLAs and health checks, and this is where you define all of those things. Um, so for our uh, use case, we've created a SAS SLA, um, health uh, SLA, you could say health check, but uh, this one uses HTTP because it's Office 365 and Salesforce, you'll most likely, your users will be, you know, accessing Salesforce and different components of Office 365 through HTTPS. So in our case, these this protocol right here might be more relevant than a simple ping. Uh, here's where you specify the different targets for your health check. So 
you know, I could measure, I could just go to 8.8.8.8, you know, but it might not be the most relevant for this particular application. So we provide the flexibility for customers to define what makes the most sense as a measurement target. Once you put that here, you add all the participating members of your SD-WAN for this particular SLA. So if I'm going to use, I'm going to send traffic out the public internet, I'm going to send it over my MPLS overlay, as well as have uh, 4G LTE as a backup, I'm going to do that. And then what the SD-WAN interface, the FortiGate controller does is, uh, you know, it, it will uh, actively measure the latency, jitter, and packet loss from these interfaces to these two targets, www.salesforce.com, login.microsoftonline.com. So just another question. Uh, for example, at 3G, 4G, mm -hmm. there is uh, some partnership that I can use on the, on the edge. For example, uh, AT&T, Verizon, there is uh, some partnership that I can use. Yeah, so the... What we have here is the Ford Extender. Um, Ford Extender, there's like a couple of uh, SIM slots. We support a, a, a wide a variety of uh, service providers. So if you want uh, an AT&T connection, just pop in an AT&T SIM card, Verizon, do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. And that will be used by the FortiGate. And because we've added it as a member, it can participate in all the dynamic uh, application steering. And there's also different Ford extenders for different regions. That's the North American set. Yeah. There is an EU set. and Because I mean, look, it's in Brazil, so in Brazil sometimes and I have South America. some problem about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so aside from this, we now can define SLA targets. So every type of, not all applications have the same um, performance characteristics and, and like a baseline in order for it to work properly. Uh, if you want a, a voice call, it might be, a, by, which we'll see shortly, it might be the case where jitter is more important than, than other factors, in which case I'll just say as long as uh, the link has less than 50 milliseconds of jitter, I'm good. This is meeting SLA. Let's stick with the, the link that we're on now. In this case, uh, you know, it, we're using a combination of factors. So as long as it's under 100 milliseconds of latency, 50 milliseconds of jitter, and no packet loss, that's my SLA for, for my, my Office 365 and Salesforce traffic. Moving down here, this defines how, how frequently uh, we send out these active measurement packets. So right here, it's once every second. Obviously, you can, um, you can have a larger interval between that if that's what you wish. If, if you want to minimize the amount of uh, uh, you know, pings or HTTP requests that you sent out, you can do that. And then you can also define like, how many consecutive failures before a link is uh, determined as uh, not meeting SLA. So it, it could be uh, you know, for, for one or two uh, seconds, um, there's, a, there's a really small brownout, but in, in the overall scheme of things, um, you know, the, the link is good. Uh, and you want to do that because you don't want it to be flapping back and forth if you have a really, really short interval. And then obviously, what, if the SD-WAN fails uh, this particular application traffic from one link to another, we'll still check on the original link to see if it's back up and meeting SLA. And that's what this parameter is for. You can restore link after 10 successful uh, health checks. Once you have uh, your SLAs defined, and you know, we, have, we have a few right here for different applications, uh, you go to SD-WAN rules to define your steering policies. Uh, in our example, uh, let's go to the one that's SAS. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that one thing that's uh, kind of unique in, in the SD-WAN space is that we can create SD-WAN steering policies uh, based off of user identity. So uh, if you want to have separate SaaS policies for, for marketing, one for marketing, and you want a, a, a looser one for sales, 
or if you want a, uh, a steering policy for, for bill right here, you could create that. You can have, uh, it, it just gives another layer of uh, granularity and it's not a, um, not a, you know, anything that traverses this, these two links will, will abide by this policy. You can actually fine tune that based on, you know, your, your organizational needs. How are you establishing identity? Uh, there are multiple methods. Uh, you could uh, do LDAP, you know, Radius. In, in our example, this is just a local user group that we created and had some users in there. But you can integrate with you know, Active Directory, pull from, pull from there, and then create your policies based off of that. Well, I mean, how are we associating traffic with an identity? So, I mean, so the idea is if I say I want, if I want a policy that, you know, Steve in accounting, I want his traffic to be treated differently. I mean, that's kind of the what seems to be in here is how, how do I know that this traffic is coming from Steve? Is it based off of the fact that he's plugging to a switch port into your switch and I know? Is it based off the fact that I've tracked somehow his IP address to his login or like what, what's that methodology? The, the, uh, the methodology is, oh, are you going to go? No, go ahead. Okay. The methodology is really the last one, but how we, how we make that association comes in different methods. So as Peter men mentioned, there's AD, there's um, you know, LDAP. There, we actually have uh, a lot of people that use uh, SAML integration for whatever that is. But in the end, it all will track back to an IP address. Even the switch port ones, which we can do with, you know, um, uh, with switch integrations, it still comes back to us as to, to what... IP address that they're associated with. Okay, I guess my confusion is you're mentioning login methods. Yes, <laughs> right, asking right. About. <laughs> but when when that login method happens, it gives us what the associate. Are you are you like dot one x when they get on the network? Like, what where is the login happening that we're associating that IP with a? It, if it's if it's AD, the login's happening on their on their on their computer. We have we're agents that they yeah. can install on on the domain controller that track all of that. Okay, right. That's what I was. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. And yep. we have multiple methods. We have you know agent. Or agent less based. Okay. It all depends on. But there's so, there's a tie-in yes. with your Active Directory environment. We're either pulling logs when they when they log in, or, or we're pulling, or uh, and that's for Active Directory. But for a lot of the other methods, they're very different. It just really depends on what your okay. authentication. But you've is. built these mechanisms in, yes. and yeah. there's like different either agents or, or mm -hmm. mechanisms yeah. that tie into your authentication systems Correct. to so associate those. users. And so is this based? Uh, is the continued uh, um, application awareness is that uh, still based on, like on on flow or? Uh, you know, do these boxes that sort of start caching? Uh, which user is is there, or does it have to do a lookup every time it sees a new a new flow coming through the box? Uh, no, it's it's going to it's going to cache that because we're we're monitoring. So we have a, a separate table that's for the authenticated access. So it'll keep associating with that uh, user until that person logs out or is timed out. You know, those those are kind of the two the two mechanisms for that. Okay, and you can you can vary the time. Uh, you have the ability to control yes. how, how long that cache time is. Mm -hmm. All right, so once we've defined our, our users, uh, now is where we uh, you know, add whatever applications we want for this rule. So you know, we have a application database that's proprietary to us and you know, maintained by our FortiGuard labs that consists over uh, you know, 3,000 plus applications. And it's really easy to, uh, to find uh, the app that you want. So in, in, in our case, if it's Office 365, just search Office, and then you can just go ahead and select all the different um, you know, granular uh, applications and sub-applications. Uh, in this case, if you want a, I don't care, I don't need to go granular. If I just want anything Office 365 to be applied to this rule, just simply select the one that I'm highlighting here. But if you want more granular controls, let's say I allow Word, but you know I want to steer uh, my PowerPoint um, in a different way for whatever reason, you could do. You know, we provide that granularity as well. Can okay. you also get to the granularity of you can download only but not upload? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, that's that's a great point, and that's part of the application control and the difference between maybe just parsing SSL certificates versus doing real deep SSL inspection, right? So being able to see, maybe not in a Salesforce kind of way, like file upload or download, but think about Box or Dropbox. You know, organizations have security policies. Maybe they allow users to go out and download things from Box or Dropbox or Google Docs or whatever, but maybe they don't want them to upload or exfiltrate any of their data and store it on those particular uh, services or, or uh, assets. And so you could be able to choose based on the activity, not just a high-level TCP IP header yeah. 
uh, what you want to permit and what you don't want to permit. Yeah. So it gives us a huge, uh, huge benefit there for the granularity of not just our firewall rules, but also how we steer traffic with SD-WAN. Yeah, and, and there, we use multiple techniques. So this requires deep inspection to look into the, the, the payload itself. Um, we also support, we also have a uh, first packet uh, identification database in which, you know, um, IP addresses and ports and combinations of them are associated with uh, certain uh, applications, uh, if that's what the, 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 the customer wants. So there, there are a lot of different methods that we employ so, so that we can accurately identify yeah. Are, are you using the well-known like Microsoft published list for Office 365 URL and IPs? Or They're dynamic. It comes from FortiGuard Labs, but certainly that would be the foundation of what we have. But we certainly so is this are, versus DNS. So the reason I'm asking is versus DNS lookup because obviously Microsoft servicing you the closest location that they mm -hmm. can provide services out of. Versus if you're back home in SD WAN, then it's you want the full list because you want to yeah. be able to optimize based off of their entire portfolio of where to go. Yeah. Yes. What, it's it's a combination of both because I, I I mean not not everybody's going to be not everybody's going to want one method or the other so we have to, we have to be inclusive for both and because it's dynamic we just have to our FortiGuard Labs um, you know keeps updated with what the DNS changes are as well as you know what's what's on the certificates you know who, who's who's giving out which certificates okay and they they publish a well known list of right. their stuff so you yep. can validate to say these are the only ones that are allowed for Office three sixty five. For Azure Endpoint, Azure Correct. IPs, AWS does the same thing for their mm -hmm. global list so that you know what BGP, AS, along with what range sets are, are validated as AWS ranges. But but the uh, you know like that's just the range list, not the you know they might not be using every IP in that that range list. But we we want to, we want to be inclusive of of those things when people are going to those. Yeah, the Office 365 one, they use every single one. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so all those are baked into. Um, you know, the ISDB essentially is what you're talking about. And so we have in there the different ranges that those um, suppliers or, or service providers publish. Uh, so that's all baked in. Any changes that come up, that's where FortiGuard Labs really kind of mm -hmm. centralizes all that intelligence into one place. And if there are changes, it gets pushed down to every uh, device that uses ISDB and or application control database. Yeah, behind, behind each of these ISDB objects, there could be like for example, Office 365, that we yeah. have over 10,000 IP ranges yeah. and 600 individual IPs in that one object that you can select and steer. So you can choose and prioritize which particular path um, traffic goes out, whether it's uh, you know multi-cloud or direct internet. It can go out. Yeah, direct internet access, or through you know if you want to backhaul it through MPLS. That's your. There are a couple of. Uh, um, there are different strategies that the, the user can uh, employ. Um, for this rule, we're using minimum quality. Obviously, the one next to it is best quality. I'll explain the difference between the two. Uh, with best quality, uh, the SD-WAN controller, uh, let's, okay, let's swap over. Best quality, all right? And we have our underlay links. So this is direct, MPLS excluded. The other two, the, the public internet and the LT, they're doing um, local breakout right now. This is what the policy says. So for all of our Office 365 Salesforce traffic, they're breaking out locally. Now, if you, if you want to send it over to your overlay, you could do that by selecting your overlay tunnel uh, members, and that will you know, go to your data center and, and out. Uh, and for best quality, uh, the SD-WAN controller will select the best path according to the user-defined criteria here. So we have latency, jitter, packet loss, um, you know, down and upstream um, or overall bandwidth. And if you want, you could create a weighted um, profile uh, based off of a combination of these uh, characteristics. Right here, as configured, it, we will measure actively whichever link at that time has the best latency, the lowest latency, and the SD-WAN controller will send Office 365 through that path. And if it changes, um, you know, uh, in, in 10 minutes or whatever, it's going to send it down um, 
let's say for some reason the LTE all of a sudden is the best path. But with the lowest latency, it'll send it down that path. Now, minimum quality is different. It's, it's like a prioritized way of sending traffic. So what I'm telling the controller here is always use our public internet link for Office 365 and Salesforce traffic until it doesn't meet SLA, which we defined in the previous step, which you know, 100 milliseconds of latency, 50 milliseconds of jitter, et cetera. If it does, if it does fail, then it'll go to the next member that we have here, which will be LTE. And, we'll, and if LTE also does, is not meeting SLA, then we'll fail back, um, finally go to the MPLS and send that traffic through it, to a, through a longer and slower path. So are you measuring on dual stack configurations? Are you guys measuring the difference between V4 and V6 on everything that's happening? Or so Office 365 is available on V6, you've got native V6. You would have to have a separate health check for the V6 address. Okay, so you're writing a separate one and then you're testing separately on V6 yep. versus V4. Yep. That's not how the clients behave, you know that, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, if I can go back to Jordan's earlier question of if I wanted to make this a voice check for voice or something, how do I make this test and actually look for voice packets or to make sure those QS markings happen, uh, whether it be an HTTP packet that we just mark as EF or, or a ping that gets marked? How do we do this? Oh, okay. I, I, I think that makes the, the question a little bit more clear. So, because um, I, I think one of the earlier questions was, you know, like, do you do uh, uh, do you measure the trans existing transactions? We do synthetic. We do synthetic for that. So mm -hmm. for the voice ones, we we can't do a voice quality check because we don't have we're not we're not measuring the actual voice calls. But what you're saying is takes take one of the synthetic checks, give it the same QoS as as the voice, and then measure it based on that. So um, it, within the uh, security profiles, I, I, I have to take a look. But what you're going to do for that, for that particular application, I would create one that's, you know, my voice check one, mm -hmm. and I would uh, tag that particular application with the same QoS value that what your voice had. And then, then it would have those same characteristics. So when I do the measurement check, I would at least get the same priorities. It may not be necessarily re re representative of the call quality, but at least yeah. it will have the same priorities applied that to it. That would be outside of the SD-WAN SLA build. Uh, Co correct. Apply the tags. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But but once you did that, then when you when you would run those, then it would have it would have those those characteristics. Okay. Thank you. You would just have to set some sort of unique destination or unique way to identify that yeah. traffic as being. This is my voice test. Correct. This is, this is my regular. Yes. Right. That's exactly. Does this source from any particular interface on the device? You can. Sp Specify what the source uh, interface is. You know, if you, if you wanted it from a particular one, or maybe you wanted to create a loopback interface, you can do that. Um, but but yeah, I, I I think your method is correct because what I would want to do was for you know because uh, let's say I'm using ping for all of them. Well, I don't if I if I set it for ping, it's for all ping. But I can I can choose to say well if it's ping to this address, I'm going to give it this QoS. If it's ping to this address, I'm going to give it that QoS. And so when you specify ping here in the in the SLA check, it will have the appropriate QoS. Set does, does that answer the question? Because I, yeah. I I wasn't quite sure before from the earlier one, but I think yeah. that makes sense now. Yeah. How quickly can you fail over to a new link? One second. One second. Yeah, that's the lowest you, we can define. So can, further clarity on that: <laughs> is that detection and failover, or is that once I've detected, it takes one second to confirm? So it'll take one second to detect, and somewhere between seconds one and two, it'll fail over. Okay. Yeah. So like okay. in mid-flow, you'll packet A is going down this link, problems detected, then packets B, C, D, et cetera, go down the new link? No. No, that, well, that would be per, kind of per packet. Per packet. We're okay. doing per-flow steering okay. right now. Oh, so when you do, when you do a, a failover, something that identifies that we need to fail over, any existing flow will remain on the link that it's on until that flow is Correct. concluded. Yep. Current functionality. So one of the things I wanted to point out while we're here is, you know, again, when we talk about consolidation, you know, being able to provide a lot of these different capabilities. We saw Peter was up in the network area with the, with the SD-WAN stuff, and you can see the different uh, routing protocols in there. So RIP, OSPF, BGP. Again, we do have customers, apart from SD-WAN, who are using it at their edge as a router. Um, and then when we get into the security profiles, being able to enable all of those different advanced security features. 
uh, being able to turn on things like AV, IPS, uh, SSL inspection, just by clicking a button. Uh, it's super easy to define uh, the profiles and then going into the policy and just enabling per rule. And so, you know, you can create on the, on the firewall side the policy for each of those rules and enable SSL inspection or AV or IPS or uh, whatever you wanted to do. And then integration with other things as well, FortiCloud Sandbox or FortiSandbox Cloud, um, just a click of a button, log in, and you're, you're connected. Can you kind of walk us through the chain of when I'm, uh, from an end user perspective, I'm transmitting over a link, how am I going through all of the mechanisms you've got on the box, IPS, firewall, AV, and then SD-WAN? Order of operation. You mean like yeah, the, the, order, of the order, order of operations? Yeah. So, okay, okay, okay. That's what I thought you meant. You want me to go back to the... Go ahead. You're good? Oh, no. I, uh, do you want to go back to the... To the diagrams? Walk through that? And so, yeah, I, you know, from a... Yeah. From a... You know, inbound packet perspective, you know, we're going to pick that up from the firewall first, right? And so, you know, with the SD-WAN, SD-WAN sits on top of the routing stack as policy-based routing. And so you're going to have... Uh, your firewall operations, and then, you know, as you come into an interface, we're going to record that session. Um, we're going to apply any firewall rules that are there. And then as it begins to exit, or QoS, right, you hit the, the outbound interface, you receive QoS, and then we look at the routing. And again, with SD-WAN enabled, policy-based routing is going to supersede the standard routing table and be able to choose, based on those performance SLAs, which interface member, right, it has to be a member, but which in interface member is going to go out, and then uh, we'll send it out, that interface. So, is, that, is that clear? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so the, the firewall operations, you know, after, it, after and we receive it? when you say it, firewall, you're also talking about anti-malware, IPS, et cetera? Correct. Oh, so yeah, so yes, all those operations are, are going to occur there as well. So if, if you have enabled your IPS, uh, your AV, uh, web filtering, whatever you have enabled there, all those are going to happen within the frame of the, the firewall operations mm -hmm. or UTM, whichever. Since you're talking about um, architecture, um, it, say if you have, you have a small branch with um, MPLS coming in on one side, internet for the other, right? You, yep. Similar to what you have there. But if you're running like uh, two devices, one, to, one for MPLS, one for, uh, and one for like your Fortigate out there, um, you have... I don't know, documentations or recommendations on how to exchange um, basically the PBR? Or do you need to actually dump your MPLS and internet circuits into that one? Yeah, device? so to perform the SD-WAN, uh, SD-WAN uh, members are, have to be defined as an interface on the gate. Um, and so if you have additional hardware out front, like a router or, or something <laughs> else, then you, know, you, can, you can kind of layer two or layer three, whatever you want to do, those back to the gate as uh, interfaces, and then we can add those at that point. But um, yeah, we're, we're not balancing separate hardware. We're balancing the interfaces yeah. defined on the gate, or okay. on the Florida gate. Uh, so I'm just going to jump straight into the SD branch. Uh, again, you know, really extending, not going to spend a whole lot of time here, extending uh, all the way back to the endpoint. And so being able to draw that in there. And so when we look at SD branch, the, the keys there are, you know, being able to ex expand visibility at your branches all through that single kind of management console and, and monitoring. But really, the benefit is helping out those short staffs, being able to automate. So automate detection, automate response, not just at the firewall or at the edge, but to be able to integrate that automation throughout the branch. And so that's a huge benefit for us. So Peter, let's go ahead and take mm -hmm. a look at that. All right, so previously we were looking <clears throat> at things from a FortiGate perspective, but uh, you know, typically cu our customers who have hundreds if not thousands of sites, they use FortiManager uh, for central management and orchestration of their, uh, of their WAN infrastructure. Uh, here, let me just try to make things a little bigger. All right. Here we have a small deployment of, let's say, 10, 11 FortiGates. Um, and what the customer will do is, uh, once you have the devices added to FortiManager, uh, go to SD-WAN. And uh, here we have a 
a map view of where all our different devices are located. Uh, you, you can zoom in and uh, right here. And we color code things a little as well. Um, if everything is good, all the links are meeting SLAs, then things will be green. But if a certain uh, SLA is not being met at the moment, things will turn orange. And as you can see, the, the SAS SLA that we defined previously, um, it's running at over 100, 100 milliseconds of latency. And, and that's why it's shown orange. And you just got to keep an eye out on that. If there are any links that are down, then it will show up as red on the map. Uh, Configuration uh, will be very similar to what we did on the FortiGate. So again, we define our health check servers uh, in our example for, for SaaS. If you, if you look at it, here's our Salesforce and Microsoft uh, URLs. And once we have that defined, next we go and define our different interface members. And when we have all of that ready, then we can create our SD-WAN templates. And templates are used uh, you can use a single template if you have only one type of branch that has uh, that all use the same applications and have all the same SLAs. If you have uh, different types of branches that have um, use you know different apps, uh, you yeah, can not every site's the same, right? So you might have you know a, a site template for you know one site number two template, site number three, and so forth yeah. and so on. And so what you do if you have multiple site templates, you go to assign devices, and then uh, let's let's say Sunnyvale for example, you edit, and then you just select whichever template should apply to that certain branch. Now uh, the templates themselves, uh, if you click in here, it'll look very familiar. Again. SD-WAN, flip it on, define your, uh, add your interface members in here, define your performance SLAs. Uh, for example, I'm just using that same SAS example. Uh, you have internet, MPLS, uh, you define your, your SLA parameters, the, the thresholds, and then how frequently we check, how, how, how long does it have to continuously fail before not meeting SLA, and uh, when to restore. And uh, you'll notice here that there are advanced options. So what we provide um, th on the gate and what by default is we'll sat make, you know, satisfy, uh, let's say, 80, 90% of customer use cases. But we also have a, a ton of advanced um, parameters and different methods of steering that we can uh, customers can use to fine tune um, their uh, whatever their you know app steering needs are. Is this a true template, or are you guys actually? Is there actually? Is it linked and you have dependencies? Is that impotent? If you go change something in the template, it'll change it across the infrastructure that's bound to the template, or is it actually a true template and you're just using it to stamp out the first set of configs for that device? So it's a template. It's not. It's not actively linked to everything. So if you made a change, it wouldn't just automatically yeah. push. You would push it. If down you change it, you need devices. to push it down to all the devices that you want the the template to be applied to. Yeah. yeah. But if so, the devices are already attached to the template, yes. it will yes. still not go and push it out on them. No. no, they're saying you have to. Once you make a change on the template, you use the install wizard, and then you just click next. You know, bring up all the all the um, different branches that it the Forta manager sees does not match what your current configuration is, and because you know we didn't make any changes to that template, uh, none of uh, the other branches are showing up in this case. And you just next, 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 and they'll push it down to that device, and that's how we do it. Um, Okay, so once, once you have SD-WAN, right, um, we talk about uh, simplifying the branch with SD-Branch. I uh, just want to point out a few different things. Uh, we provide what we'd like to call, you know, true single pane of glass um, for, for the entire branch. So uh, you're talking about APs. You have your APs right here, and then um, you know you can monitor. You can create um, you know floor maps for it. Uh, you could have your entire wireless infrastructure show up on a on a Google map. Obviously, there's only one in this case. That's why it is where it is. But uh, you could have floor maps. Uh, you can edit and you know 
drag and drop all where your APs are located. You, have, you can create central uh, Wi-Fi profiles, SSIDs, uh, how radios behave, and then you push it down centrally to all of your different APs across your entire uh, WAN infrastructure. You can also do the same thing with switches. Uh, so switches, uh, you can monitor, and, uh, and it'll show up here. Second, and then you can actually look at the status of each port on every single switch that you have managed with uh, Fortin Manager, irregardless of where it is in, in the world. As long as it's being managed by Fortin Manager, it will be able to pull that data and, and tell you the util how each uh, switch port is being utilized, what VLAN it belongs to. And then on the other side of things, you can create central switch templates, uh, define VLAN centrally, uh, define um, you know, port security centrally, and push it down uh, to all of your uh, um, layer two um, infrastructure um, from Forta Manager. Yep. So, so that's, that's Forta, uh, Forta Gate with Forta Switch and Forta AP, which we call SD branch. And so when we get into the secure SD branch, Again, it's extending from the edge all the way back to the endpoint to be able to get that automation or integration from multiple devices, multiple types of things. And so that's where Alex is really going to come in and kind of tie together what the fabric looks like. Uh, again, SD branch, secure SD branch is really just laying the foundation for our greater security fabric. So at this point, we're, we're just going to really turn it over to Alex. Just, just one oh, question. Sure. All your presentation so far, what I saw is the branch that talked to the DC and somewhere in the cloud. Does your solution easily support fully mesh uh, VPN between yes. all our sites? Yep. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and, and the, so we, we don't, this, this um, we don't really, care what the what the connection is to and so whether that be a partial mesh or hub and spoke or multiple hub and spoke it doesn't matter if it's a if it's an interface on the fortigate it can join the sd wan virtual link and then we can uh we can choose based on those performance slas to use that path or not are you asking about if it's a like an auto vpn functionality within the sd wan up to that extent let's say right. that i have yep so we do, we have, uh, we have ADVPN, which is Auto Discovery VPN. So, you know, same thing, building out that kind of uh, capability to um, you know, set, up, set up VPNs between them. Um, and, and so you can do that again through the VPN manager here in the Forta manager, or, you know, you can do that per device as well. Is there, uh, no, go ahead. Is there any mechanism for multiple overlays? So the idea is, you know, it's not just connectivity, but maybe I have some sort of you know compliance need to separate traffic in and amongst all my branches. Great question. Great question. So we we actually have and, and Rob mentioned it earlier, and Alex could probably speak about this for for the next 24 hours. Um, but we have what, what we call virtual domains, and so that's patented technology. Um, and so the Fortigate can actually create separate uh, autonomous instances within itself. And so SD WAN, you could have an individual SD WAN virtual link per virtual domain. And so having a retail site that, hey, we, we would like to separate out our POS devices. And so we create a virtual domain for that, virtual domain for all the rest of the retail devices. And that way we're segmenting off, protecting all of those PCI transactions potentially uh, from the rest of the environment. So two questions there. The virtual domain then shares interfaces? So multiple virtual domains share an interface, or does it have to have its own WAN link? Or it w it would have to have its own WAN link unless you had a another virtual domain that they both routed into that would share the WAN links. Okay. So think of them as separate devices in one device. Right. So yeah, yeah, they would each have their own interfaces. Each would have its own virtual link or SD WAN interface. But like Alex said, you can create one like a higher level. Right. and then route them all out through one. So that answers route. the second question, because the interface then would be unique. You're not sharing an interface, it's not like multiple tunnels. It's going to be the Correct. tunnel across this particular interface, but because the interface is dedicated to this particular link, mm -hmm. if you did it, pipe it into a third virtual domain. Sorry, I'm trying to make sense. Mm -hmm. else right. Third virtual domain, it would just be two tunnels for that virtual domain. Correct. Yeah. And okay. it just depends on what type of compliance you really need to have, right. because if if the regulations say, um, because we've actually uh, uh, worked with a number of, of very different regulations, like um, the, uh, the casino industry, for example, they can't. 
they can't share the WAN link. You know, it's not so. So, so they would need separate infrastructure for you know SD WAN for WAN and SD WAN for their non gaming section. And and at that point, you know, just two VDOMs with two separate ones would work fine for them. But if you want to share that same WAN infrastructure but still have that separation, you would want that lower level of separation going into a third. What is the what are the scaling limitations on virtual domains? I'm assuming it's per box, or there's probably different ones. Yes, d uh, the there are different different ones for different sizes. I would say the the smaller ones the usual limits usually around ten. Um, uh, the medium sizes goes goes up to twenty five to fifty, and then on the on the biggest ones you can go up to five hundred. Okay, and how about how many how many <laughs> actual VPN tunnels can be handled? Right. So if we talk about a full mesh, obviously as you scale up, that becomes harder because each mm -hmm. box is now adding a bunch of tunnels. The the good thing is um, the NP that the network processor that is that is handling the VPN connections can go actually very high for number of dedicated tunnels. So uh, full mesh is usually not a problem. Um, maybe on the smaller branch boxes where it becomes a problem is not so much on the number of tunnels, but the number of tunnel setups you have. So if you have a failover from one device to another or a network outage and all the tunnels go down and come back up, that can take a longer period of time. It's not. It's not really the number of tunnels that you have in total that's going to be your limiting factor. It's just going to be, you know, how much tunnel setup can you do? Yeah. But as a reference, uh, you know, Nurov shared earlier that that, uh, you know, retail organization over in uh, EMEA, they, uh, they had a requirement for 40,000 tunnels. Um, that's really one of the reasons why we, we, we were able to pull that in uh, because, of, you know, the, the other competitors in that particular opportunity. I'm assuming that 40,000 tunnels is more of a hub and spoke than a full mesh. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? yeah no doubt. Right? Yeah, because you're going to put some serious hardware at the, at the front end, and then and then yeah. each of the branches is going to have minimal. Uh, the virtual domains, I'm assuming then uh, topologies are arbitrary by virtual domain. So mm -hmm. I can, you know, in my regular day-to-day, -day, do, do a full mesh, or if I wanted to separate yes. voice, I could do a full mesh, but leave my data as a hub mm -hmm. and spoke. Hundred yeah. percent. Okay. So on on the same lines, right? I didn't notice that there's a controller. Your control plane is running on your boxes. A controller for for, for SD WAN. For SD WAN, yes. Mm -hmm. That was the Forda manager. In the last instance, we 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 uh, looked at the Forda gate first. So you know, if you do have a small implementation, three five devices, you can use that. The the controller plane or orchestrator is what we call Forda manager. And so the last instance that we looked at that we were running through where the switch and the uh, AP are managed, that was our Forda manager or, or no, our global But that's machine. only the management, right? Not, not actual controller, where your route computations, your tunnel buildup, everything is happening on your on devices the 40, itself. On the 40 yeah. so itself. It, so coming back to Jordan's scale question, if, if it's a full mesh topology, um, what routing protocols you support, how many prefixes, how, how much can you scale in full mesh, right? How many sites? Uh, that's a good question. It does it does vary by model. So the small the smaller units have uh, a, a smaller number of routes. It really has to do with the amount of memory that's on the box more than anything else. Um, there there is a little bit of CPU just because of you know when you have to do route recalculations and stuff like that. It can it can make a difference. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but um, in our on the um, Fortigate website, there's our product matrix, which usually will list what those values are. And as I, as I said, varies from model to model, but um, from a from a um, sizing perspective, they are all sized appropriately for the different kind of use cases for each of the, the of the appliance sizes. Okay. And VM and the, for the VM ones, it also scales depending on how many CPUs you allocate and how much memory is allocated. I mean, Snail, you'll be surprised if you look at our product matrix or data sheet. We actually have a lot of specs because we like to provide detail across everything: okay. VPN tunnels, different specs, latency, memory. So, highly recommend. Take a look. But uh, that's our one angle to provide all detail answers mm -hmm. there. And, and then um, does Fortinet support segmentation on SD-WAN, like multiple segments? And can each segment have a different topology? <laughs> Uh, we just talked about that. We just talked yeah. about the virtual yes. domains. Yes. There, there's some, the we, way they do the, it a little bit differently we, by using the, the virtual domains. Yeah, virtual yeah. domains, yeah. Mm -hmm. 